Hello and welcome. This is uh, the much anticipated uh, Q&A with uh, Josie Valin here for at our Desk for Ukraine conference. If you don't know who he is, uh, Josie Valin created uh, the programming language Elixir, which a lot of us really, really love, like 10 years ago uh, or something. It's, it's, been, it's been quite a while. And before that, he was very active in the Ruby community, Rails, uh, lots of people use device, and we just want to talk about him to Alex and everything. So, hello, Jose. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. I'm really glad that you're organizing the event and I have the chance to participate. Thanks for doing this and, you know, thanks for being here with us. So, I just did the intro. Did I forget anything major that you would want people to know about you? You know, maybe, you know, so for some, it will be the first time ever seeing Jose Valim. So, you know, what else should they know about you? Yeah, so, yeah, um, you know, uh, the other way to go uh, about it is that I am a Brazilian guy living in Poland for also for, you know, more than 10 years. So, um, you know, Elixir was created while I was like, I, I was used to joke in, in during the Polish winters because I did <laughs> not, I would not leave home. Uh, but yeah. I've I've been working on Elixir and ecosystem for quite some time, so that's the definitely the main intro. Actually, when you know when I got to know of you many years ago, this was actually quite mystifying to me because I was there was this really really cool guy in Poland with his plat with his company Platform Attack, and then I was like, but I never met any of them, you know, like there's this huge company in Poland, none of the Ruby events, I met all of them. And then it took a while to realize that I think, you know, the rest of the company was in Brazil, right? And you were yes. the only one in Poland. So for years, I was very confused about all of that. Uh, <laughs> but but that's me, that's not uh, part of the official q &A. So I think we already kicked it off well, because lots of the questions that we got were actually about sort of like the inception of uh, Elixir, like lots of people seem to be really interested in that. And so one of the questions that we got was, what was the main drive when starting Elixir? Was it some curiosity? Was it a frustration? Or what is it that you wanted to solve by creating this new programming language? Yeah, this can go really long. So I'm going to, to like summarize the elevator pitch version. So I was uh, working on writing concurrent uh, software or writing concurrent solutions in Ruby at the time. I was not happy with how the code would look like, with, with the bugs that would appear, and how I would solve them. I decided to explore solutions. So at the beginning, I was like, hey, you know, maybe there's a good way of solving these elsewhere, especially because this was more than 10 years ago. Everybody was talking about concurrency even back then. So I was like, let me study. And then I say, when I started studying, I found like two points where that changed like my programming career. The first one was when I found functional programming because I realized that many of the bugs that I was running into, they would simply not happen if I was using like a, a, a programming language that uh, would favor immutability. Um, and, and most functional programming languages, they or probably all of them, uh, they do favor immutability. So I was like, okay, that's great. And then I found their language on machine, absolutely fell in love with it. And then I was like, okay, the next software I write is going to run on this virtual machine. And, uh, and one thing like to the other, and I was like, okay, I think I can bring some new ideas to this, you know, to this ecosystem, to this virtual machine. And that led to Elixir. Nice, thank you very much. I would like to take a bit deeper there. So like, what in your mind are some of the main ideas uh, that you brought to like the, the Beam ecosystem and the Beam virtual machine? Oh, uh, that's a very good question. I think, so one of the things that I still really love about Elixir is the, is what we call the protocols. So, um, so one way that you can think about it, I mean, depending where you're coming from, I'm going to give you many examples for the people who are joining us. It's kind of like, it's not really, but it's the closest thing. It's like duck typing in, in Ruby and Python, but way more explicit. It's like interfaces in Go, type classes in Haskell, 
protocols in closure, but I think this concept, uh, the, the idea of say, hey, give me anything as long as it obeys, like give me any data structure, as long as it obeys a contract, I feel like this is such a powerful idea that I use every day. And for me, this is a, a, a very important concept that is part of Elixir. And also, and there are other things that are more like, there are some, some that are more debatable. So like the metaprogramming aspect, right? Uh, it, you know, it, it's a little bit like it can be used greatly, but it can also be, be abused greatly. And there are other things that is also more about, uh, you know, like the focusing, like putting a lot of effort and attention on the getting started experience and make people, you know, make the whole experience of like getting to hear about Elixir at, uh, at the first time and then putting production, trying to make that as smooth as possible. So I think those were important contributions. Um, yeah. Or important ideas that I've worked on, like, you know, there were, uh, the, you know, some of those things, they were of course happening already in their lane community too. Right, with uh, I I really enjoy uh, Fred Hebert in the if I sorry if I mispronounce his name, like in their link community and all the materials that he write and contributed as well. So, but yeah, th those are the things that for like I worked on and, and brought them in and uh, with me. Yeah, it's very very interesting to hear you say. Because like, you know, when you say that, that you use protocols every day, that makes me feel like I underuse protocols because I definitely do not use them every day. And so I have another follow up to this, uh, if, if I may, is sort of like, what is maybe, you know, one, you know, feature that, that LX feature that you see sort of like underuse in the world where you often sort of like come to, like you look at the library and you're like, oh, this would be so much better if it used X. Maybe let's first go with this and then have a follow up. No, but 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 I but that's the thing, right? Like you actually you use protocols every day. You're you use them. You're using them all the time, right? Like well, every time you you are using IX and something prints there, it's a protocol. You are rendering something in in a Phoenix HTML page. There is a protocol there. So I'm not defining protocols every day, but I'm using them every day, and uh, and I think that's the 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 important difference. And there are some things that you know, like uh, some abstractions, some ideas that are really enabled by protocols that would be tricky to have uh, without them. Uh, so so yeah. So regarding a feature that is not used, I'm I'm not. I'm not actually sure if I can come up with, with an example. I think like the main features of the language, because like the main features of Elixir, if we take like protocols, but everything else, right? Like processes, pattern matching, it all comes from Erlang, right? Which is why I didn't mention them before, because we were talking about like what is what Elixir brought to the table. And I think like there is really good usage of those features and, you know, um, yeah. Okay, cool. And on the other hand, you know, is there maybe sort of like a feature that you think is overused, like not just of Elixir, but you know, like everything that Elixir brings. So also pattern matches, you know, processes and everything. Do you see something that maybe people are a bit too eager to dive into and another sort of like simpler solution uh, would usually do the job? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, they are like the, one of the things is that we've, I think we have always tried as a community to notice like uh, what we would consider to be like bad patterns and try to correct our curse. So uh, course, maybe, anyway. <laughs> um, so for example, one thing that we could have said is like uh, people like abusing configuration could be one of them. And um, so, you know, like we would use configuration when we should not use things at compile time. But like three years ago, we noticed like, hey, this is a really bad idea. There were people saying that's a bad idea. And we kind of like were able to auto-correct a lot of that. And you know, now if you go to the documentation, 
our library guidelines and saying, hey, you should not be using configuration. So we have like an official reference to point people to. So uh, I think a lot of that helped a lot into like say, hey, you know, if this is bad. So I think at a point, I don't see it happening as much as before, um, right? And then there are other things that, so for example, a recent uh, Elixir feature that we added was two new functions in the kernel module, which is the module that uh, is there by default for everybody, which is then and tap, because, um, you know, people they are writing long pipelines and, and the pipeline's always about like piping to the first argument of the, the next function. But sometimes people wanted to pipe to the second. And my advice has always been like, you know, like uh, if you need to do that, like write a private function or something like that. But nobody was doing that. Well, nobody was following my advice. So this is something that I would complain in the past. Say, hey, you know, you should not do that. And, uh, but I realized at some point, like, you know, um, that there is like, there is no amount of warnings, documentation, uh, interviews that, you know, I, I could go into that would like, uh, that would get people away from doing that. So we introduced like then to make it easier for you to, to say, hey, I want you to do something slightly um, different on this part of the pipeline. So, you know, it's, so that's something that, you, you know, like I would, uh, a year ago, I would say, hey, you should stop doing that. But now we have like, I can still say stop doing that. But because now we have a proper way of doing it, people are, had already stopped doing that because there is a better way that we can kind of like everybody agree on. Yeah, that's better, you know? So yeah, I, I'm hoping we, we are fixing the, the, the you shouldn't do this uh, along the way as we move forward. Cool, thank you. I must say that's, always something that I've really appreciated when learning Elixir, sort of like the pipes, because what it makes you do is sort of like, you know, you think about what is sort of the main argument to my function, what's the main data structure that I want to work on. And that has actually sort of like changed the way I code in other languages, because it gave me a better understanding of, you know, what should the order of, you know, arguments be. So I always try to follow your advice. So I love small private <laughs> functions, but yeah, I, I know that everyone does. Okay, cool. So another question uh, that we've got was, you know, Alex is already 10 years old, as we just mentioned. So first, congratulations also from whoever asked the question. Uh, did you ever imagine it would become this big? And where do you hope to see it in another 10 years? Yeah, so the, the answer to the first question is kind of going to answer the second question. So uh, I, 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 I didn't imagine that it would get this big, but not because like I didn't think that it would. It's just that I just avoid thinking about those things in general. You know, like, of course there is a plan. There are things that I want to do. Like, you know, I have been working for the last year, a little bit more than a year in bringing like Elixir to the like numerical, uh, numerical computing, Elixir running on the GPU, working with large amount of data. We have in like live book, we have been putting a, putting a huge amount of work on this. And of course there's a plan, there's a vision, there's a place where I wanna go, but I don't think like, like I think on what I need to do, I don't think like, you know, oh, what is it going to be like when, when, when I get there, right? Like I know what I have to do, so I do that. And, and, and that's it for me. It, it, the rest doesn't come really much into the equation. Uh, and, and I think at the beginning, I was just to say that that's for like, you know, like for defense mechanism purpose, because, you know, like, uh, uh, I think a program, a new programming language statistically is most likely to fail to not see like large adoption. So, you know, I think it would be like kind of silly to, you know, like to expect it to grow somewhere because if you're going to have like a realistic expectation, you're going to say, well, it's not going anywhere. And, and that can be demotivating, right? Uh, so I was like, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do what I gotta do. And that's it. Cool, that is a very pragmatic uh, approach to sort of like working and designing a language. I love that. Uh, so if we look into the other direction, basically not sort of like next 10 years, but 
a lot of people have asked a question sort of around this. So I'll pick one of them. I suppose you asked this a lot, but if you could redo Elixir from scratch, is there anything you would change fundamentally? Yeah, so it's very tricky because, so I, I use this metaphor elsewhere. It's kind of like building a language, you know, it's like kind of like a, a Jenga game, you know, the one with the blocks. And it, it's not like, it's not like you take one block, right? And like, oh, I don't like that feature and then I'll take it, right? and or oh, I'll replace this. It just isn't really like that. Like if you, I, I mean, sure for, for smaller things, yes. But if you're talking about like the, the language thing, they're all connected. So like every time I would think like, would I do something different? It has like so many reper repercussions. Like it, it puts me into, into, in, a, in a rabbit hole where I'm like, well, then this would change, this would change. And then I'm like, well, this wouldn't be Elixir anymore, right? It's like, you know, it's, so, I, I also like, I, I, like I've made my peace with it, right? Uh, it's like, well, maybe I'll do something different, but it just cascades into so many things, different opportunities, maybe changes a little bit the Erling uh, compatibility, maybe some patterns that would like today would no longer be possible. So uh, there are always these qu questions like these. Like, so for example, not that I regret, but just to give an example, Right, like, well, what if we didn't have optional parentheses, right? Even even for Elixir today, like, we have we have kind of agreed mostly as a community that we want to use parentheses and leave them out in some places, and tools like the formatter help enforce that. So even if you say like, well, what if we don't have optional parentheses or we restrict them even further, like only inside do expressions or something like that, right? It's just that it changes like. When you do that, there were many decisions that were based because the parentheses were optional, then they no longer need to be there. And reevaluating this all is like, you know, it, it, it's a big impact, it's a big change. The other one that I think about is like the, uh, the keyword syntax, for example, like should the keyword syntax be different? Should it be not? Um, so yeah, so you know, like, and, and again, it, it, it's a cascading effect. Um, so, so yeah, I, you know, I, I, I think about it from time to time, but um, I think there, there's more change, there's more, if there's something that I don't like today and it's small, then I'll fix it today, right? But the big ones, it, it is what it is, you know, uh, I've made my peace. I know, I, you know, we've talked about this before, sort of like the idea that you don't see, I think, an Elixir 2.0 coming along like anytime soon. So you don't want to introduce any breaking changes. But it's more like, you know, if you know, if you didn't have to worry about breaking changes, you know, what, what would you do and what would change? And I, I would actually like to ask a bit more about one of the things that you mentioned, because we also got uh, quite a few questions about that, especially since it's a, a bit of a more hot, well, not hot topic these days, but it has a bit more Is it attention. a dot? No, it's not the dot, like something that you already <laughs> mentioned. No, not, not the dot. No questions about the dot for me. But you know, if you want, we can talk about it. No, it's a, it's a keyword list and the maps because sort of like Erlang changed its default recommendation from, I don't think they called them keyword lists, but you know, the, the list of tuples changed it to maps. Yeah. And you know, and in Elixir, it's the keyword list, and the keyword lists have the fancy syntax where you can leave out uh, the brackets and everything. Yeah. yeah. And so there's we received some questions about like, you know about changing it or maybe also my question would be sort of like, why not change it? Yeah, so, um, well, regarding the dot, I'm going to publish an article soon. So uh, if somebody's wondering, if somebody was like, yeah, I wanted to ask about the dot, there's going to be an article on the Dashbit blog soon. But uh, regarding maps and keywords, we actually, we had this discussion. We had the option to default to maps because when maps were added to Erlang, it was before Elixir 1.0. So we actually discussed this. And there are actually important properties for the keyword lists that we use today. Erlang doesn't use as much um, that we use today because, um, so the nice thing, like, so we have lists, right? And we have maps, right? And keyword list, it's kind of like, you know, it's 
the child it's sitting is sitting in the middle but what makes keyword leads inter keyword list interesting is that it it adds properties that maps cannot have and they are basically having duplicate keys and um and they preserve the user ordering of the the operations that you pass so the the, the order of the keys it's important and then there are places where we use this this kind of information and this kind of information is important so uh for example like when you do uh an import, for example, you say, hey, I want only those functions. You may want to say, I want the function uh, map with uh, or reduce with RT2 and reduce with RT3. So there you are repeating the key. And, and there are other places where, I know what you remember on top of, 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 my, of, of my head, but like Acto is another example of a DSL that you know, uses the fact that you can duplicate things. So we actually, we use this feature uh, in, in a known, in, in a reasonable amount of uh, scenarios. But I also, I, one of the things that I don't like is that um, about like the, using maps for options as well. One of the things that I'm not really a big fan is that then maps is starting being used for too many use cases. And the use cases, they are like a little bit overlapping. So for example, when would you use a map today? So, well, when I want to have something that I kind of, I don't know what the keys are about. So for example, well, something that maps an ID to a username, right? I can have like infinite IDs, as many users as I have in my system. So I really don't know the key. So it's kind of like a lookup thing, key value, general key value. That's one use case for maps today. The second use case for maps today is like, is when I 100% I know the keys, the, those keys should always be there. And then using maps as an options, add a third case, which is like, it's something that I know the keys, but the keys may not be there. And I'm, I don't like it. I don't like like about having those three different new cases because those last two, they are very conflicting. So they, for me, it kind of makes maps a little bit like less intuitive because now I'm going to see a map in a code base and I'm not going to know if it's something that is supposed to have all those options and never change or if something incomplete. And I don't like that. I like, I think like it makes everything so blurry and, and I'm not a big fan. I prefer to look at maps and say, oh, if the keys are there up front, I'm like, okay, it's a map. It's always expecting those keys to be here and that's good. So that's like my my official take on the matter. I mean, I completely understand if people would also say, no, we would rather just have a single data structure and use it for everything. And I can see the simplicity in that approach, but you know, I, there is also this other side that I'm trying to present here that I think uh, have like, uh, you know, that has the rationale. And we talked about this like literally like 10 years ago. Well, not 10 years ago, but almost 10 years ago, plus before one now. So, yeah. Cool, thank you. That was very fascinating to me. I, I had forgotten about input, like the, the use case that I think everyone is aware of is, you know, the actor and the query syntax, uh, but also, you know, your, your thinking about, you know, the incomplete, basically the incomplete map where like that, that was very fascinating for me. So uh, thank you very much uh, for that really, really uh, in-depth answer to the question. We'll go, uh, bit of a switch of pace to something else uh, because it is something that also fascinates me and like I'll tell a little background story because I, I once opened an issue on Elixir where it was like hey um, map dot like first calling map and then flatten is faster than calling flat map and you probably don't remember this but you replied to the issue within 17 minutes and you had two implementations of flat map that were both faster than the current implementation of flat map and at that moment i was like wow you know like when does he sleep you know how much does he do it so the question is how many hours do you usually work today and how do you divide your time oh yeah that's uh that's probably something so i've recently cut up an arm injury so that's probably something that i need to to work on myself and uh improve actually to 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 work uh less like but one of the things that i have been like very 
for today is that I've been working remotely before working remotely was cool, uh, like for a really long time. Um, and, and that has always helped me because, you know, um, I, I and kind of like can always be around, but the, one of the things that I'm at least I'm disciplined with is that when I'm supposed to be like, uh, like when I'm out of the computer, I'm out of the computer, right? I'm not, I'm not like, I'm not receiving notifications on my phone. I don't have like GitHub on my phone. I don't have like Twitter, like the app installed on my phone, this kind of stuff, right? But, but you know, but the, the reason is that it would allow me to stay like a reasonable good amount in front of the computer and kind of be, uh, uh, be responsive. But the other one is that I have like, uh, there's also a lot of it is just like the timing. I, I, so I also don't have notifications for anything. So it's not like you open up the issue. So it's just your timing was very good. That's the main thing. Because if you open up an issue, I don't receive a notification. I don't get anything on my computer. Um, but it was probably the time like, you know, the first thing I do, maybe that's not the most productive, but the first thing I do is to check my email when I, uh, when I started working, right? And then I'm going to work on my stuff. And then, well, if I finish a feature that I wanted to do, then I, I'll go check again. But, you know, many times I just like, okay, I check my mail and now I'll go deep in this thing that I have to work on. It may take two hours, three hours, but, and I'll be focused on that thing. No interruptions. Um, but yeah, so, you know, uh, uh, like I'm checking my inbox and then going through the issues like, uh, two, three times a day. And I think the timing was just, you know, but there's also the other thing that I also want to add is that uh, the fastest way to nerd snipe me into anything is benchmarks. I love benchmarks. I love like make things faster. So, you know, like when somebody says, hey, like something is slow, I love the challenge. I love like, I love the challenge. Of, like somebody say, hey, this is, this is slow. And can we make this faster? uh for me it's always very fun i always enjoy the process of like figuring out what is wrong how can i improve it coming up with different solutions for me it's like it's uh you know it's very entertaining i love doing that so there's also like this personal aspect like you know uh maybe there were like 10 issues in my inbox but i saw this one oh this one's about performance and i was like i'm going to do this first for sure um yeah so yeah, that's but that's kind of like how it would go usually when I'm working on on open source. Yeah, I mean, I mean, as you know, I love benchmarking as well, like quite a lot. And it's often, you know, it's like it's like playing a programming game, right? You know, you try to increase your high score by making the code faster until you, you can't yeah. make it any more faster. And it's, you know, it's just objectively better, you know? It's not otherwise, you know, it's no, is this good code? Is this bad code? Does this feature really help the user? You know, it's all kind of subjective, but it's like objectively this one in this use case is faster. So yeah. you just know you made something better. I, I have I the numbers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <it's> exactly. Like... <laughs> Look at them. Oh, wonderful. Um, so like another thing that I would like to know about um, or a question that was submitted is you do these use case studies of Elixir and like, I mean, in general, you're very sort of involved in the community. So like we can see, you know, your commits or like your contribution across many packages. You apparently talk to many companies and, you know, is there a use case that you encounter like a use case of Elixir where you were like, oh, wow, you're using Elixir for this? Wow, that's really surprising. Was it something like that happened? Oh, multiple times. Uh, I always like to tell like nerves for me was the biggest example of like people using Elixir for things that I would never have thought about. Like I'll never have uh, come up with. And that's why when people say like, hey, what, what should I build for Elixir? I'm like, don't ask me, right? Because if you ask me, it's like, you know, it's... Uh, if, if everybody was making those decisions based on what I think, we would not be where we are. Uh, so, um, so yeah, so for nerves is for me is always the biggest example, right? Because, uh, and I mean, when, when you hear like Frank and Justin talking about, you know, why nerves and why Elixir and the Erlang VM, everything makes sense. And uh, so, you know, uh, using the, 
writing embedded software and all the companies using nerves for like all the different kinds of things, you know, um, uh, you know, like people have Elixir deployed at home because of nerves, like things related like to controlling electricity, water. I even have a joke, like uh, at an event, somebody told me like, oh, uh, we are using Elixir to control like the water stations in like this whole area in the UK. And then I'm like, don't tell me this. It's like, I don't need this. I don't need this responsibility. Uh, anyway, but yeah, so I think like a lot of those cases there are very exciting. And I'm, I'm hoping that I will see a lot of people also surprising uh, us with the machine learning stuff and people doing like really cool things that we wouldn't think about it. Um, and that's going to be nice as well. So maybe on that, on the machine learning stuff, sort of like, so where is it? I mean, there's like lots of people have been working, I mean, lots of, like a few people have been working on it for, for quite some time now. And so like, when do you think, will we see sort of like the first company, or maybe there is already, and I'm just not aware of that, just so sort of like it goes all in on like machine learning with Elixir. Yeah, there is a company already Ooh. using, uh, I think they are in beta. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to remember the name, but you know, when this goes up, they can tweet it to it and say, hey, it says, um, that is already using some of the machine learning uh, for, for the prediction stuff. And that has been really cool. But you know, there, there is still a huge gap. Like, uh, you know, there's a lot of work we need to do because the thing is that it's not only about like machine learning and AI, is when you're doing machine learning and AI, you need a lot of data. So we also need to improve our tools. We already had some like Flow and Broadway, but we also need to improve our tools for working with like massive amounts of data. Uh, so um, that's why it's so much work. And, and yeah, and, and, and there are things that are like started with this effort that are already usable today, like Livebook, right? People are using, like one of those we created a Livebook was because we were thinking about like, machine learning and you know like the all the experience that people would get around that we're trying things out running experiments right that's kind of the one the main idea of your notebooks that I want to like run experiments of the data see like data plotted and get feedback get insights um, and you know we started livebook for that but there are a lot of people already in companies already using livebook because it's actually great for a bunch of other stuff um, and I think slowly we are going to continue to see like specific use cases, right? So one of the tools that uh, we are working on is called Xplotter, which is about something called uh, data frames. And the way, the simplest way to think about data frames is like table. Imagine you have tables of data, right? Like you have a column with millions of rows and you want to work on this table. Data frames going to help with that. And I can see like a bunch of people using data frames, perhaps more people using Explorer and data frames than like a neural network, exactly because of the data aspect. But it's all related to this numerical computing, this like this ground effort about like bringing all those features and ideas to the ecosystem. And one of the things that it makes like it's very exciting for me about all of this is just about like, you know which is something that I did a lot when I started Elixir because a lot of Elixir was like, well, I want to have those things, but how would those things look like if they were implemented in a functional language and you're in virtual machine? So it's so nice to kind of like go back to do this kind of exercises again and think about those problems once again. So, you know, work with the community, helping design the solutions. I still, I still absolutely love the fact it has been a year since we announced it that you know like we have a subset of elixir that compiles and runs on the gpu right for me that's just like amazing and i'm really hoping that we are going to like release the first batch of like the first versions because a lot of those things are still in the github repo story because we are like working on making them stable and i really hope that soon really soon we are going to be at a point like hey you know there is at least an initial version of everything so people can you know, at least have something that they can try out more directly. Wonderful. That is fascinating. Yes, that, you know, that Elixir can run directly on the GPU. This is something, you know, had you asked me two years ago, I was like, no, you know, it's never going to happen, you know, and, uh, and like, you know, 
the progress, the technology we make, it's uh, it's impressive. And so your work and those of you know all uh, the contributors and all the maintainers of all of that is very uh, impressive and a continuous joy to just see and be part of that. You know these surprises come along. It's like oh by the way we're doing machine learning. So, oh wow okay cool. You know I guess I can also do that in Elixir, uh, which is very very awesome and uh, very amazing. We're reaching the end of our time, so. I would just want to ask you, though, know, is there anything else that, you know, you just want to tell people like something that we didn't get a question about that you feel like a desperate need to talk to people about like the dot syntax or something? Uh, no, I think, I think, uh, I think we, yeah, I, I'm good. Um, we can, you know, can briefly say about the event. Um, you know, those who have the opportunity to help and to donate, you know, uh, it will be really awesome if everybody involved can do that and can contribute. Uh, me living in, in Poland, uh, in Krakow, we have also been helping in other ways, uh, you know, hosting people, meeting people and helping where we can. So it's uh, both an opportunity to, and I know a lot of people have been doing that. So both an opportunity to, to, to ask for those, you know, with the event now who have, uh, who have the opportunity to do so. And also, um, yeah, just acknowledging that, um, you know, the work and appreciating the people who have, who have helped me, for example, and this kind of stuff. Okay, hey, thank you very much. I think I can sign that statement and you can go to the website and you can still hit that donate button. I mean, we're recording this right now, so we're not over 100,000 yet, but I would really, really like to see us, you know, hit that $100,000 uh, goal uh, that we could have. So, Jose, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me, to talk to us uh, today. Thank you for all of your work and yeah, have a wonderful day and thanks for all of this. Thank you. You too. Bye, everyone.